biochemistrants, Ben Asman here. It's just in time for part one of the aldol reaction. The aldol reaction, another important carbon-carbon bond forming reaction, but this time it requires not one but two separate carbonyls. Let's start off with a little bit of nomenclature when it comes to carbonyls. The carbon at the carbonyl, of course, called carbonyl carbon, but then working our way out, one step will be alpha carbons, then beta carbons, and finally gamma carbons, and we continue on like this as long as we need to. However, the important ones are the alpha carbons. The hydrogens on the alpha carbon are particularly acidic and can easily be deprotonated by a base. This leads us to our deprotonation inlate form, shown here on the left, which is resonance stabilized. This stabilization is the primary reason those hydrogens are acidic in the first place. However, now you have a very useful nucleophilic carboanion, that lone pair with a negative charge on the right hand side. They can attack the electrophilic carbonyl carbon of another aldehyde or ketone, shown here in blue. This creates a new carbon-carbon bond shown on the right hand side in red. The newly opened up and now negatively charged oxygen can then pick up some hydrogen from a hydrogen source. This can be an alcohol or water or an acid. Now normally we would be done here with a carbonyl and an alcohol. However, our reaction today does go further. It has one additional step and you're going to need to figure out what this last step is to give us our final product. To aid you in this, you're going to do a few chemical tests. However, I'll be talking about those more in part two of the aldol reaction. Today we'll be doing part A and B. Now the main difference between them is the relative amount you use of the different reagents. Make sure you take that into account when you're writing the balanced reaction for both A and B. Starting with A, today you're making your own sodium hydroxide solution. Now sodium hydroxide is hydroscopic, so it absorbs water from the air. This means that you don't want to leave the bottle open even if there's someone standing right behind you waiting to use it, and when you inevitably spill some on the counter you want to pick it up as quickly as you can rather than leaving it there to melt into a very concentrated basic puddle. Remember to record the exact amount that you used. Wait, you're missing some sig figs there. Thank you. Now, every reaction needs a solvent, and in this case we have two. Our first one up is water. We'll add that in, dissolve the sodium hydroxide. This is an exothermic process, so you may notice it getting hot. If it gets too hot, you can put it on ice to cool it down a bit. Then we'll add the ethanol. Remember, anytime you're dealing with solvents, you don't have to be perfectly precise. Plus or minus a mil will not make any difference. Now that we have the first solution set, we're gonna go ahead and make a second solution. We're gonna use syringes like in previous labs to measure out the benzaldehyde, red caps, and the reagent grade acetone, green caps. Lastly, we're gonna add some additional ethanol and then take it to the vortex blender. Now the vortex blender can shake its way off the table so you gotta hold it with one hand, press your cap test tube into it for about three seconds and it'll be mixed enough. It will not look any different, it will just be mixed. The benzaldehyde acetone solution is gonna be added dropwise into the sodium hydroxide solution. It's very important that you have this stirring as fast as you can and so your droplets hit the path of the stir bar so they get integrated completely. This is real time and the rate that you should be dropping it in with. Note the color change from clear through a murky orange. Finally, to a powdery yellow. Vacuum filter product A and rinse out the flask with some 50% ethanol. Rinse the remaining yellow filter cake with additional amounts of water and ethanol. That's it for part A. Leave this in your drawer to dry until next time. Now fish out the stir bar and start part B. Ideally, you would have prepared all your reagents during your wait time for A. Make sure you're doing this in the smaller 25 ml flask, but you will need as before, sodium hydroxide, benzaldehyde and acetone. Notice that the quantities have changed. And as we are using one mil syringes and we need three mils of acetone, it will take three whole syringes. Vortex again, once again, combine the two dropwise while it's spinning as fast as it can. If it ends up looking a lot like product A, then you messed up and you need to start again. But if it's clear and dark orange or a little yellow, then that's fine. Next up, we're gonna extract the solution from part B using dichloromethane. Remember that DCM is denser than water and therefore will be on the bottom. Now DCM and basic solutions both take longer to separate. We are keeping that bottom organic phase this time. Next, we're gonna have to remove any remaining water using a drying agent. Remember that the exact amount of drying agent you need is different from person to person. So add some in and swirl it around. If it clumps together, then you're gonna need to add some more. It should go from murky to clear. At least some of the drying agents should act sandy when you swirl it around. Pre-weigh another 25 5 mil flask. Though I have it here, you won't really need the boiling chip unless you're going to boil off the solution today. For most of you, that will not be the case. What you will need is a little piece of cotton inside a short stem funnel in order to filter out the drying agent. Make sure you rinse the drying agent with an additional portion of DCM in order to get any of your compound off of that drying agent. Leave this open in your drawer in a place that it will not fall over so it can evaporate by next time. See the description of this video for part two. But that's it. You're done for today.